Hi, I'm the political junkie. Our story begins here, at the Deptford Dockyard. It lies on the River Thames, about six miles east of Buckingham Palace. It was founded in 1513 by Henry VIII, and for about three centuries played a principal role launching newly christened ships of the Royal Navy, as you can see in the 1747 painting of the St. Albans Maiden Voyage. Other, larger ships of the line were constructed here as well, which is why it served as a hub for shipbuilders and apprentices from around Europe. Another advantage for Deptford was while strategically located, it was far enough from central London to grant visitors some peace. There were even gardens and large homes nearby, like the Says Court, an Elizabethan mansion, where the six foot eight student Peter Mikhailov resided during his 1698 visit. Mr. Mikhailov had a voracious appetite for learning the design aspects of building such magnificent ships, but also the hands on, day to day practices of operating a navy. He spent some months in the Netherlands looking at windmills and shipyards, at Oxford University, the Royal Society, and then finally the Royal Observatory, absorbing contemporaneous strategies for ship navigation. Despite how studious he seemed, he and his mates managed to trash the Say's mansion evenings and weekends. They stained carpets, burned chairs, shot holes in portraits, even raced wheelbarrows through the aristocratic hedges. Under normal circumstances, this would warrant eviction. But not when your tenant is the young Tsar of Russia, one who would come to be known as Peter the Great. Peter, like many of Russia's leaders, was determined to drag the country into the future. The purpose of this grand embassy into Western Europe was to learn how to modernize the Russian navy. But while he traveled, he noticed the way Europeans acted and dressed, their architecture, even the way the men shaved their beards. He developed what you might call an inferiority complex about the half-Asiatic, half-European rule empire which he reigned. And this is just my opinion here, but he seems to have identified Russia's naval disadvantage perfectly. When he left London, he took with him experts and quickly built a proper Russian fleet. Where he seems to have diverged from reality, however, was when he decided that by imposing European architecture and fashion on Russia, he could emulate those Western powers. And he did try. He forced warm weather European fashion on his ice cold winter empire. He demanded men shave their beards. He was known to rip facial hair off their faces. One Russian tradition he would not question, however, was his absolute power as Tsar. Caesaropapism, that is, the merging of Caesar and Pope. The Tsar was God's chosen autocrat, and the Orthodox Church, a mere department of his holy government. His power sat atop a pyramid dangerously unstable, a society comprising over 90% feudal peasants living in destitute poverty, forcibly tied to land and landlords. And it was many of these peasants who were conscripted to build Peter the Great's new European city, St. Petersburg. Tens of thousands of peasants died constructing an imperial city on a swamp, replete with European Baroque buildings, churches, and facades. The city was said to have been built on bones. Peter fulfilled his vision for European modernity by exploiting an archaic feudal system. How fitting then that Peter's Romanov dynasty would end in this exact city 200 years later. Now most of us here think of the Russian Revolution and we immediately think of Marx, the writer of the Communist Manifesto, Lenin, the leader of the Bolsheviks, later Joseph Stalin. But what you don't see at this moment, at the collapse of the Tsarist regime in March 1917, is communist initiative. Bolshevik and Menshevik socialist agitators were present, sometimes organizing, but they didn't start the revolt on the 7th of March. Their best were exiled, Vladimir Lenin in Switzerland, Leon Trotsky was in New New York sampling Jewish delis. The Tsar abdicated not at the point of a communist gun, but at the behest of army chiefs and ministers. And while the provisional government that took over after him certainly contained socialists and revolutionaries, its prime minister was a pragmatist, a liberal reformer always uncomfortable with radical forces. Furthermore, most of the crowd on the street during those nine days weren't trained revolutionaries, but a diverse mixture of peasants, mutinous soldiers, skilled and unskilled workers, even pudgy liberal business owners, and their cause was decisively pro-bread and anti-Tsar. To understand if the February Revolution was communist, to understand this gap between the image we have in our head of the start of the Russian Revolution and the subtle realities, we need to go deeper with this topic and examine a missed opportunity for reform in Tsarist Russia before the February Revolution, before Peter the Great's Caesaropapist pyramid finally eroded into the wind. Let's talk about someone unimportant. But by being unimportant becomes critical to our understanding of the pattern of Russian history. Trust me here, it'll become clear. 
Let's talk about Pyotr Stalipin, Russia's Prime Minister from 1906 until 1911. Now wait, if the Tsar and his autocracy didn't fall until 1917, how is it that there was a parliamentary figure, a Prime Minister, ten years prior? It's important to understand that the February Revolution in 1917 wasn't the first Russian Revolution. This is a photo from 1905. In the center you'll notice Father Georgi Kapon, an Eastern Orthodox priest, leading columns of tens of thousands of peaceful demonstrators towards the Winter Palace where Tsar Nicholas II lived. On the other side, you'll see some of the 12,000 troops sent by Nicholas to stop them from delivering their petition for fair wages and an eight-hour working day. Father Gapon, like many of the workers there and like peasants across the country, believed a number of myths about the Tsar, myths which Orlando Figes describes clearly in the first chapter of his book, A People's Tragedy. He writes, Three perceived principles of Muscovite Tsardom appealed to the Romanovs in the final years. The first was the notion of patrimonialism, whereby the Tsar was deemed to literally own the whole of Russia as his private fiefdom in the manner of a medieval lord. The second principle of Muscovy was the idea of paternal rule. As the embodiment of God on earth, the Tsar's will should be unrestrained by laws of bureaucracy of duty and right. Lastly, there was the idea of a mystical union between the Tsar and the Orthodox people, who loved and obeyed him as a father and a god. It was a fantasy of paternal rule, of a golden age of popular autocracy. That last tenant of a mystical union the idea that the Tsar was a benevolent despot. This is what convinced Father Gapon and his crowd that day that the Tsar would receive their petition. Perhaps the Tsar simply wasn't aware of their sufferings in the factories. He would remedy it, if only he knew of it. 1,000 demonstrators were shot that day on their way to the Winter Palace. The Tsar wasn't even home. He wasn't interested. There was no mystical union only Sisyphean piety. In response to the deaths and injuries at the hands of the Tsar's guard, a massive protest movement was born. Nearly half a million workers held strikes in the following month. Chaos spread to the countryside. Under threat of violent revolutions, Tsar Nicholas II reluctantly issued a call for reforms. He would form an elected National Assembly. Granted, he could dissolve this new assembly any time they suggested something not up to his liking. And in keeping with that, he needed a sycophant to lead his Trumpian institution our unimportant person, Pyotr Stalipin. I'm choosing to speak about Stalipin, who became Prime Minister in 1906, not because he was a hero, far from it, but because he was a reformer. And in his attempted reforms, in the pushback against his reforms, we can see the cracks in Russian society just before it toppled. Now in a serious irony, our last great reformer, the man who some historians say might have saved the Russian system from collapse, was himself a violent supporter of the status quo. The Tsar selected him specifically because of his brutal tactics suppressing peasants in the countryside, in downing strikes and political dissent. He executed so many that the hangman's noose came to be known as Stilipin's necktie. He was a provincial governor from a rich family. He supported the Tsar's system and his actions must be viewed through this lens. Any reforms he pushed were an attempt to save the system that had been so good to him and his family, and so bad for the masses. The largest group among those masses was the peasants. In 1900, they numbered 100 million and accounted for 85% of the population. Stilipin tried to organize property rights for these communities accustomed to communal ownership of family strips of overused farmland. In doing so, he believed Russia could develop a middle class, a strong group of independent Russian farmers. Prior to 1861, the peasants lived as serfs, forced to work land for landlords who enjoyed infinitely more legal rights than they did. But even after Tsar Alexander II emancipated the serfs in 1861, most continued to live in destitute poverty. Like former American slaves, freed serfs didn't enjoy economic opportunity or legal equality simply because they were free. As a result, many peasants found themselves heading towards the big cities. Russia was undergoing industrialization, and St. Petersburg and Moscow offered opportunities to live a Marxian nightmare. Long hours, child labor, disease, sleeping on wooden cots in factory barracks, and all for less pay than their still really miserable European counterparts. 
By 1900, two million peasants had joined this new class of urban labor. In his quest to save the Tsar's system, Stilipin introduced legislation in the assembly to improve conditions for factory workers, give peasants civil equality, and to provide universal elementary education to all children, including for those in the empire of different ethno-nationalities. But in trying to do so, he alienated another strata in this wobbly Russian pyramid, the Orthodox Church. As Feiges describes, church representatives in the assembly smacked down Stilipin's education reforms and his plans for ending discrimination against religious minorities. The Orthodox Church was the second largest Christian sect after it split with Catholicism in 1054. As part of the Tsar's Caesaropapist cult, it enjoyed ubiquity in the empire, even if the illiterate peasants were unaware of its tenets. When liberal reformers within the clergy and politicians like Stilipin began to push a new role for peasant education, conservatives within the Orthodox Church scrambled back to their Tsarist roots, aligning with Nicholas II and away from change. It returned to its tradition of stamping out resistance to the Tsar in rural areas, missing its opportunity to serve urban industrial workers in these big new population centers. But Stilipin's final failure came when he alienated his fellow noblemen. Even after manipulating the electoral system to reduce the influence of those on the left, he struggled to pass a reform of local governing systems because of new opposition on the right. The landed gentry were wary of his plan to introduce a voting system based on a combination of property and nationality. And rather than backing down, Stilipin committed political suicide. Faced with resistance, he made a dramatic ultimatum to the Tsar. According to Edward Acton in Rethinking the Russian Revolution, Stilipin consented to continue in office only on the condition that the Tsar suspended both chambers of the assembly, disciplined his leading opponents, and promulgated the reform. The Tsar felt humiliated, and Stilipin's downfall was widely predicted. Now we can see how this unimportant prime minister, who truly only made enemies during his time in office, nonetheless illuminates Russian society for us. He suppressed those on the left and the right, and failed to reform for the masses. His land privatization and education programs did little for peasants and urban workers, while angering the church and his fellow nobles. In pressuring Nicholas II with an ultimatum, he lost the support of the man who chose him in the first place. And this is what I really want to draw your attention to with this video. The Tsarist system was unwilling to change. Stilipin's violent flair earned him deserved disdain from the left, but his gradual transition from the Tsar's hand-picked agent to pariah among his fellow nobles shows just how entrenched the Tsarist systems were. The point here is not to downplay Marxist influence. It was all over. Socialist revolutionaries played a huge role in the February Revolution. But the ultimate fall of the regime occurred because these pillars of society, which Stilipin identified but failed to address, simply resisted change until they fell over. Historians continue to argue if the Russian Revolution was inevitable. Check out Edward Acton's book to see the fault lines in that debate. But as I'm a storyteller and not a historian, Suffice it to say, this is a recurring motif in Russian history, militant opposition to incremental change. Let me explain. On September 14, 1911, both Stilipin and the Tsar attended the theater at the Kiev Opera House. During the second intermission, anarchist revolutionary and police informer Dmitry Bogrov drew a gun and approached Stilipin near the orchestra pit. Bury me where I am assassinated, Stilipin wrote in his will. Attempts had been made on his life before, but the meaning behind this trip to Kiev made the situation different. He and the Tsar traveled to the city in order to unveil a monument to Tsar Alexander II, the so-called Tsar Liberator. A man who, in an attempt to modernize Russia in the 1860s, had loosened censorship laws, introduced local self-governing, trial by jury, eliminated corporal punishment in the military, even emancipated all Russian serfs almost two years before Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in the U.S. But it didn't take long for the populace to become dissatisfied with the effects of the emancipation. Nobles' wealth crumbled without free labor. Newly freed serfs were slapped with exorbitant property prices as they tried to buy pieces of the land on which they were once enslaved. 
believing that they were acting as populists for all of Russia dissatisfied with the slow progress of reform, a socialist revolutionary group called the People's Will assassinated Alexander II in February 1880. As punishment for his incrementalism, Alexander was hunted down and murdered with bombs. It was 30 years later, on a trip to revere this reformer of Russian society, that Pyotr Stolypin was shot twice on the floor of the Kiev Opera House. As per his will, he was buried in that city. With all opportunities for change now dead or embalmed in bronze, Russian society waited for the catalyst that would push it over. Playing at the opera that night in 1911 was the tale of the Tsar Sultan, during which the Tsar travels far away to fight a war, but while away learns that his wife the Tsarina has given birth to a monster. The details of that fiction were likely long forgotten by the true Tsar Nicholas II, as he enjoyed lunch in his usual fashion on March 15, 1917 in Piskov, 300 kilometers from Petrograd, the name he gave to St. Petersburg. By that afternoon, he would abdicate, the final Tsar of Russia. A strange fact when you consider that as Tsar Nicholas entered the Great War against Germany in 1914, there was a moment of national unity. Aside from the far left, the country came together behind him and the fatherland. Military funding and readiness were up since the embarrassing Russo-Japanese War, and the Tsar and his affection for all things military ran his household with an officer's discipline. This meant that Nicholas II felt engaged with his armed forces. He even obsessed over the flair of the uniforms. But there were three major problems. One, the military was not ready for a long-term war of attrition, a war of prolonged trench warfare. Supply shortages affected the front lines as well as the fatherland. Two, the army was mostly peasants and the officers mostly members of the nobility. As the death toll rose on the Eastern Front and hunger set in back home, morale plummeted. The government to which soldiers dedicated their lives was submitting them to death without equipment or rations. 3. Tsar Nicholas may have liked the military, but unlike Peter the Great, he was no tactician. Even worse, he was a fatalist. When he fired the Grand Duke and took personal control of the military command on September 15, 1915, he believed that God would guide him. However, the reality was that the incompetent Tsar had now directly associated his dynasty with a disastrous war. Every failing on the front, every empty stomach back home would be personally linked with him. The celiac society was just waiting for a scratch. For for that reason, you and I need to discuss the role of the military in the success of the February Revolution. The fundamental question became, would you shoot your own mother? It sounds hyperbolic, but this was essentially the order the Tsar telegraphed his generals in Petrograd as protests turned to riots on March 11th, 1917. Tell those peasant soldiers to fire into the crowds. Shoot. End it just like in 1905. Only blood can change the color of history, said Father Gapone after that bloody Sunday ten years prior. And now the Tsar was demanding that his capital be a canvas. It started on March 8th, with groups of women demanding bread. By evening, they were joined by men as 100,000 demonstrators took to the streets. March 9th saw 150,000, 200,000 on the 10th. Violence broke out as calls for bread became shouts for the end of the Tsar and the war. Nicholas ordered that the protest be dispersed with bullets. But Russians had learned their lesson in 1905. Backing down now would only embolden the regime. Every protester shot by police further inflamed the crowds. Revolution was at hand. And Critically, soldiers began to disobey orders to kill civilians. Mutinous middle-ranking cadets chose their people over their commanding officers. As politicians in Petrograd made arrangements for a democratic election and a provisional government with liberal Georgi Lvov at its head, a more uncompromising figure was already plotting ways to undermine them. For him, this bourgeois revolution of moderate liberals would fail to bring Russians the peace, land, and bread they desired. A true socialist revolution, one that would actually pave the way to communism, would be his. On the 15th of March 1917, on a train stranded 300 kilometers from his capital, having been stabbed by each pillar of Russian society, peasants, workers, nobles, reformers, and reluctant revolutionaries, the Tsar's final gash came from those he admired the most, the military. The unanimous advice of his generals was that he, Tsar Nicholas II, should abdicate his role as Caesar and Pope. A tu brute? 
I have a podcast. It's called YouTubers United, and it's the podcast by growing YouTubers for growing YouTubers. It's a collaboration with Tristan over at Step Back History. If you're interested in hearing authentic accounts of the daily grind of growing on this site, actionable advice for your own channel, or interviews with successful with successful creators, go ahead and click here to listen to episode one and subscribe. Later, guys.